So thank you. We now will have a Turo Trust. And um, kindly, if you can uh, uh, hear me. Farai, yes. you yes, have I the can floor. Go. Okay, okay. Farai, right. you have the floor. Thank you very much, Ferdinand. Uh, my name is Farai Gumisai. Uh, I work with the Turo Trust in Zimbabwe. So Turo Trust simply means it was a sustainable use of resources organization. So here's the presentation outline. Okay, so first we are going to, I'm going to introduce uh, Turo and uh, the district at large, how it looks like. And then we are going to go on to the principles we are using, we are promoting those we are struggling with and uh, uh, those we are scaling up because of the uh, online sessions. And then we have some pictures at the end, which are supporting our, our principles. Then here I'm going to talk about uh, the, uh, the background of Turo. Turo is a grassroots based organization, which was started in 99, 1999, and is operating in Chimaniman district uh, up to date. And then our vision is Turo is empowered the peaceful and united communities of Chimaniman in neighboring districts with the well-sustained natural resources, health and food for your people, as well as uh, productive food processing initiatives and marketing business. So this is for the benefit of those who are new to the organization. And where are we as Turo? We are in Zimbabwe, and uh, in Zimbabwe we have uh, five agroecological regions, uh, from region one up to region five. And now, uh, looking on the regions, uh, region one and two, they receive high rainfall and they are on the high altitude. And from region three up to region five, they are on the uh, lower uh, lower rainfall area, which is the low veld. And when focusing now uh, in Chimani Mani, Chimani Mani is quite a unique um, a district because it has all the five uh, agroecological regions. So you can, you can proceed. So the map you see there shows the geographical location of Chimani Mani in Zimbabwe. And to your left, uh, it really shows the agroecological regions of Chimani Mani. And the one you see in yellow, uh, right on the far left, that is uh, the agroecological region uh, five, which has, uh, which receives a low erratic rainfall. And in most cases, it is the drier part of the district. Then you can move on. Okay, one of the principles we are effectively implementing here in Shimani Mani is the promotion of local seeds. Uh, as in Turo, we are promoting farmer-led seed systems. And uh, how we are promoting this principle, we are working with the farmers uh, within the district. And uh, since we started this, uh, the seed work, we've uh, worked with the seed producers. We have trained the seed producers within the whole district and Chimani Mani has uh, uh, 23 wards and within the wards we've trained uh, uh, the seed producers and the ones we train these seed producers, uh, they now go and uh, form some seed study groups. And these study groups, that is where they learn, they share experiences on how uh, pure seed can be produced at local level. And then we also promote the uh, use of the open pollinated seed varieties. And in most cases, these are OPVs, uh, the local seeds, the land races that are uh, in the community, they were, they were in the, pro the, 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 the community uh, from generations and generations. So we are promoting that farmers should scale up using these seeds. And as we are speaking right now, we have uh, many farmers in Chimani Mani who are promoting uh, the local seed production, this OPV seed production, and we are multiplying this through the uh, the, the the structures I've uh, mentioned earlier, the seed study groups uh, with the, the trained seed producers who then cascade the information to other farmers at the seed study group level. And then how do we go about it? 
once we have farmers who are trained, we now uh, know that once the, the, the seed production has been done, what will be left is now to save the seed. So we now have community seed saving systems where we have uh, some farmers within, the, with the, within each ward. Because what we are doing here is that once farmers produce their seed, they should be in a position to exchange or to sell the seed. So once we have farmers, uh, community seed saving uh, farmers who save the seed at local level, even when someone comes, came into human man district from wherever, and maybe in Zimbabwe, from other provinces or other districts, that community seed saving can access uh, the farmer or the, the, the customer can access the seed from that, that community seed saving uh, uh, area. Then from there, uh, we now have the seed distribution centers. These seed distribution centers are located in various areas of the world so that maybe farmers, we know that farmers are specialized in different uh, seeds. Some a farmer might be specializing in uh, beans production or uh, maize. So in this seed distribution centers, that is where the seed will be stored. Then if someone wants the seed, you access that seed from the distribution senders. Then how are we promoting now learning among ST farmers within our Chimanman district? Now we have what we call a uh, seed and knowledge phase. Farmers come together, they showcase their seeds uh, during this um, uh, seed and knowledge phase. They put their seeds together and then that is where we have uh, uh, the agritech team or which is the, 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 the ministry, the line ministry of agriculture. They come uh, on the seed, uh, seed and the knowledge fair, they also inspect the seeds to see whether they are true to type and whatever. Then after that, there will be an open uh, fora where farmers come together. They discuss about the seeds which are displayed. During this time, farmers share knowledge, they share experiences. And at the same time, some farmers from other districts or some other organizations who are more interested in seed production, they can also come here and share and hear some experiences from farmers and they can also support farmers maybe through exchange of their seed and even buying of their seed. Then from this seed, uh, we, we, when we display the seed at the market at, at, at what level, we also now go to cluster level where some few individuals say from uh, a ward, five farmers would now represent that ward. Then a district level, we now have farmers coming together and then showcasing their seeds there. And then it also creates a platform where farmers learn, farmers all exchange their seeds. And then on the district the seed market today, that will be a big event, which will be advertised at, at national level, even at provincial level, district level. Farmers come together now and showcase, display their seeds. Then during this time, that is when we also can invite even um, the national radio, even the national television. They also come to this, uh, to this event. Then they cover and through that coverage, they can also now uh, play uh, the videos at national level even, or even uh, broadcast at, at, at the national, at the national uh, radios. Therefore helping in information dissemination about this market day. But during this uh, market city, uh, district city market day, we see uh, all farmers within Shimaniman district coming together and then share experiences as well. And as we can see, Shimaniman, as I've said earlier, is it has uh, different um, agroecological regions. So during this time, that is when farmers come together, they discuss uh, what is helping uh, the problem they are facing with the main idea of really uh, having our district be food secure. That is the, the core business here. Once farmers discuss, they discuss about how to grow the seeds, uh, management practices in the field, and, 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 and so on. That is on the district seed market today. Then you can proceed. Then we also have some benefits from the seed work we are doing promotion of the seed work in Shimani Mani district. We have also noticed that there's improved the diversity of seeds because uh, when we started, 
uh, we had uh, farmers were growing a limited number of seeds, but now we are not seeing that there's now a diversity of seeds. Then there's also improved soil fertility. As you know, we are also promoting uh, uh, growing of uh, leguminous uh, crops such as beans. And during the process, they also enrich the soil with uh, nutrients. Then there is also improved access to incomes. How? Because when farmers come together, uh, they also have that platform where they sell the seed, they exchange the seed. And we also have some farmers who are now specializing in seed production. As I've said earlier, a farm might be specializing on bean uh, seed production. Then the farmer grow that seed in quantities. Then farmers or other farmers who want the seed or customers, buyers who want the seed, they can be always referred to that farmer. And that is income generation. And as we can see, we had that sense of late where farmers were neglecting some of the seeds, like sesame, uh, like finger millet, uh, pure millet, and so on. So with the seed work, we are promoting, we are also uh, encouraging farmers, teaching farmers that they need to go back to the seeds they used to grow. Like I've said earlier, the, the rapoco and, 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 um, and sesame, since they have uh, nutritional value, which is of paramount importance in human life. So we are also seeing that the neglected and underutilized seeds are now coming back. They are re resurfacing at district level. And then I, I think I've uh, talked about the nutrition and the health aspect, and then the improved food security. On our seed work, we are also encouraging farmers to focus more on uh, small grains, especially the pure millet, uh, the finger millet, and all those small grains you may, you, may, you may talk of, because they help farmers to mitigate the effects of climate change. They are drought tolerant. Uh, they can also survive under low erratic rainfall. So in that regard, we are also promoting uh, food security. Then oh, you can go on the next slide. Next slide. Then we are also uh, one of the uh, principle we are really doing uh, here in Shimaniman at most is animal integration. We have a project here we are implementing, which is holistic land and livestock uh, management project, where uh, this uh, concept is helping. Uh, we are using farmers uh, to restore the balance, the rangelands, and the crop fields. Uh, how are we going about it? We are putting our animals together, do collective herding, and use uh, plant grazing so that there is consistent, there is a plant the balance, we restore our rangelands, even the crop field. There is what we call the movable crows, which we use to enclose. Uh, the livestock, especially the cattle, when we want to impact the, uh, say, a crop field. Uh, so we use this movable cross called the bombers. We put them and then the animals will be enclosed inside. Then, uh, say, after seven days of night crawling, then that field will be fertilized. And the how part is that when the animals are together, uh, they insert the dung, they insert the urine, and then there's that direct fertilization of of uh, of the of the of the field, and then at the same time we can see that even the, when the soil is uh, uh, is is kept, the hoofs also play a pivotal role in the natural cultivation of the land because when the hoofs are together within that enclosed uh, uh, piece of land, they will be uh, loosening the the soil so that they will be high infiltration of water, the high, uh, high concentration of the, microbe, uh, the microbes, because we are, that is a natural process. And as you may know that when the animals uh, deposited their dung, they were having, having some bacteria and all those. So we are promoting uh, natural uh, enrichment of the soil. You can move ahead. Then the benefits of uh, livestock integration, as I've said, there is reduction in soil capping through hoof action. As I've said earlier, the 
the project is all as, is assisting on the restoration of the range range. So we are not really uh, upgrading or uh, restoring our crop fields in terms of nutrients, but also our range range in the sense that when an, when I had a, a large head of animals move together, the wolves will be really cultivating the, the land so that the, when we receive our rainfall, it infiltrate and when it infiltrates we we'll see that the hoofs also incorporate uh, some seeds uh, into the soil uh, maybe the seeds will be uh, uh, dispersed maybe uh, through the uh, the cow dung or through beds or the natural processes but the hoofs will now help to put the seeds into the soil and when we receive rain for that will create a conducive environment for germination so we happen to see that there will be a very good uh, ground cover of new plant species coming out new grass species coming out therefore that will facilitate uh, high infiltration of water then after that infiltration of water we will see that uh, ground water the the water tables now will rise and you happen to see that the dried up uh, rivers and the streams will now resurface again. Therefore, we, we are now restoring our, our, our degraded areas or our balance. Then when we put animals together, it is also good for us to manage uh, the head because it is very easy made for the veterinary service to come and inspect the animals together. And as we will be having the headers, they will be monitoring them animal health from day to day. And at the same time, there will also improve the food security. As I've said earlier on that, we use the animal to enrich the soil, to add the nutrients to the soil. Having um, a livestock which is of good health, uh, we can sell that and have, an, uh, and have incomes. And that can also help in, uh, in food security and income generation as well. The next slide. Then on the principles, uh, which we are doing less in terms of their practices. Here we have uh, uh, no chemical stress. Why our farmers are not uh, taking it up as we uh, expect? Then farmers are struggling with the fall armwim. I think there's an outbreak of the fall armwim here. And then farmers are reverting to use the synthetic chemicals to try to mitigate the effects of the fall armwim. And um, currently, the farmers are using synthetic chemicals oh, to 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 keep the uh, that that phenomenon, which is uh, which has come a challenge here. And then, inadequate knowledge on useful natural remedies. We know that uh, the natural remedies can also help in fighting even the phenomenon. But at the current uh, situation, we have inadequate inadequate knowledge on how we can get rid of the the fall armor. And we also have the issue of uh, input, su input support systems. As we know, we have uh, the presidential scheme as well, which is supporting uh, use of synthetic uh, fertilizers. So you will see that at community level, uh, farmers are supported with uh, synthetic uh, fertilizers for, their, for, the, for fertilizing their fields. And once you see farmers being uh, given some subsidies in terms of these synthetic chemicals, it's obvious that they they use. However, we have some farmers who are really sticking to use of uh, our natural remedies, and then we also have some donor, some some uh, development partners who are coming on board and supporting uh, with the synthetic fertilizer. That is um, some of the challenges which we are facing. Next slide. Then the issue of uh, no, no or low till. As I have uh, uh, explained earlier, we have uh, five agroecological regions. And then in, uh, in region one, maybe two, three, farmers uh, experience uh, with the growth, which is uh, very high. And once this happens, uh, the farmers will now uh, use some ring holes and some holes to, to get rid of, of the weeds. Therefore, therefore, they will be disturbing uh, the soil, and uh, some farmers are still using uh, the mud board plows in in land preparation, and uh, traditionally they used to do that. And uh, you know, it's a it's a gradual transition uh, for us to reach 
where a situation where the farmers will be really uh, using this principle of not disturbing the soil. Uh, next slide. Okay. Then as a result of uh, uh, this uh, online uh, learning session, on the no chemical stress, where we scaled up training of integrated uh, on integrated pest management. How, as I have stated earlier on, we are having some ref refresher courses with uh, our seed producers and the newly pro seed producers. Uh, we are training them on integrated pest management so that farmers are well equipped from uh, land preparation up to up to harvesting on on the natural way of farming. Uh, and then we also uh, have during this training, farmer to farmer learning and sharing. We also create a platform where farmers come together. They discuss on how they can manage the pest using our own natural, uh, natural ways. And as we are promoting agroecology in our district, we have also uh, launched the issue of agroecology open day, where at what level we are bringing farmers together so that they discuss all issues to do with uh, with um, agroecology, including the pest uh, management. So we have a platform whereby farmers come together and then they discuss about all agroecological agroecology issues, maybe the successes and the challenges and the way forward. And then all the biostimulants. Oh, we have also trained uh, the lead farmers, 21 lead farmers within the district. And then these, these lead farmers are also conducting some trials where we are now having uh, some comparisons of the trial. For instance, the way a farmer, uh, we were training some farmers on bokashi uh, making in the even the feminine cow manure as the as the top dressing. So farmers also used to use the thermal compost, uh, the usual thermal compost, and um, uh, even direct the application of animal manure from the crows. So we are having some trials at a local level where we are trying to co create a conducive environment. Farmers come together, then they experiment, they learn on their own on the trials, what is good for them. So we are we have some a lot of trials uh, on this one. And we also scaled up the issue for uh, biofertilizers like the bokashi uh, and even the feminine cow manure since they are very easy uh, to access at a local level. Then active uh, involvement or participation of the local authorities, like I've said, uh, the government, like the Minister of Agriculture, we are incorporating them. We are uh, in, inviting them in all these uh, trainings so that they will have a, a common understanding together with them. Then next slide. Then now uh, we are going to show the pictorial um, presentation on the principles. As you can see here, we see farmers uh, in what the 13 year old, they've come to a seed a distribution center where they put their seeds together uh, in preparation for other farmers to come and collect or other um, farmers from other people to come and buy. I'm sorry, Farai, uh, time is up. Maybe if we can just uh, scroll and uh, see the pictures. Thank you. Thank you. I think that was a great uh, presentation and uh, some of the participants are very happy with um, uh, the format of your presentation, especially you've given the characteristics of uh, the principles and um, for other um, attendees please uh, we are uh, focusing on uh, sharing the nine principles uh, through the learning and sharing uh, work group and uh, this is brought courtesy of uh, what we shared what was shared by our collaborators from uh, India, the Andhra Pradesh State on Community Managed uh, Natural Farming in collaboration with, uh, with AFSA. Uh, thanks a lot uh, to Rotwast and Farai for uh, having that uh, good presentation. I can only sample a few observations and I can see Athanas uh, really appreciates uh, the use of uh, the movable kraal 
And I don't know what's the size of the herd and what's the land holding uh, size that you, that's just one comment I have, if you can quickly answer. Sorry, you can come again on that one. What's the size of the herd uh, for the movable crowd? And uh, what size of land are you working on? Oh, all right. That is a very good question. I think on um, the, the size of the, the, the land that can be uh, impacted by a head, it, uh, all, it all depends with the um, size of the head, maybe uh, the, the group heads. But what we normally do is that we have, um, say you, we have uh, a number of, number of livestock we have. Like uh, say you have 15, I just want to try to narrow down to, 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 to your question. But okay, in general, in Gujganga, which is the pilot uh, what, uh, with the pilot project for this uh, uh, project, uh, we have four clusters there. And uh, the first cluster is uh, something like 615 livestock, which are on the collective head. And then now, depending with the size and the number of farmers who wants the field impaction, then that head on field impaction alone, especially on the crop field, that animal can be uh, broken now into say, um, uh, say a head of 50 those animals can be brought together and then impact. And then maybe the other head is, uh, is there, is on the other side. But in terms of hectareage, I can give an example of one word, which is Changazi, which is in Changazi, what 20, in the Gujganga area. There was field impaction of uh, nearly six hectares of, of, of land, which was impacted using, which using the, the concept. But off we, off we end, I can now, I can't give you the, the actual figures at district level, number of uh, plots which were impacted. Well, that's fine. Uh, somebody is uh, asking about uh, use of dung and uh, urine. Do you uh, at any point use uh, human uh, urine? No, at the present moment, no. We only okay. enclose the livestock, especially cattle, to, to fertilize. <laughs> Uh, that was okay. I mean, that is that is okay. I think his concern was um, on the feeling uh, on using uh, human uh, urine and uh, the adoption. So thank you so much, Farai, and thank you for your great uh, presentation. I hope, uh, Rosaline, you're now getting ready uh, for uh, the second slot. Th thank you, Farai. I think you've done your best and uh, using a mobile phone, I think is not an easy uh, thing. Thank you for uh, uh, showing up and uh, thank you for that great uh, presentation. Uh, thank Rosaline. You. Yeah, Rosaline, uh, you have the flow. I hope you will stick to the time and uh, there is a proverb in, uh, there's a saying in uh, Western Kenya that the firstborn always says, if uh, I would have killed my mother, uh, none of you would have been born. So if you are a secondborn, you, you will not do the way the firstborn has done. I hope you'll keep time. Welcome. Please unmute yourself. Yeah, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Rosine Daishimie and I work for Bush Rwanda here in Rwanda. Um, really so happy to be here um, to share with you some of the things that we have learned um, from APCNF and what we have practiced and things that we are, ch we are challenged with currently. Um, you can move to the next slide. Um, so um, this is quickly, a couple of quick information about Rwanda, and I'm sure Athanas might have a little more information about this, so I will not spend a whole lot of time on this. Um, our country is called the th a, a country of a thousand hills, and uh, and that is true. If you come, you will see it's a bunch of hills um, making most of our farmland on steep slopes. Um, we have these rainy seasons. Um, we have like rainy seasons. 
um, and the dry seasons. Um, in agriculture here, we have at least two seasons, one starting from September, um, harvesting crops around uh, January and February, and then another starting from around this time, or early in February, going and stretching into June and July. And then from July through August and June, we have a dry period where there is not a lot of rain, um, things are dry, and then it picks up again um, in the fall. Um, our annual precipitation will be that, but however, the challenge is that rainfall patterns are quickly changing in our country, um, which is actually some, an opportunity for agroecology, some of the opportunities we have learned uh, through our colleagues in India. We can go next slide. Okay, so some of the main crops we have in Rwanda, and this is not a final list, but this, these are some of the major crops that a typical farmer will have in their, in their fields. So maize, beans, Irish potatoes, bananas, cassava, uh, sweet potatoes, rice, and um, in, the, in the swamps, um, but um, also for cash crops, tea and coffee. Then we have some like horticultural crops, uh, for vegetables and fruits, and more, mostly like with the government pushing for more of these for export markets outside of Rwanda. So we can continue. Um, some of the challenges that we are facing in uh, Rwanda's agriculture, there is a huge issue of erosion. I, as I said, our country is on steep slopes and like most of the farmland being on hills, uh, which makes it really prone to erosion. Um, we're losing a lot of topsoil um, and contributing to land degradation and, uh, and also uh, fertility loss um, in, many of, in many spaces in our country. The other also is soil acidity. Um, and the last one is really um, pest infestations, much like uh, um, the people in Chimani Mani, we have an issue of me worm and different fungal diseases, depending on like the crops that people are growing. So, um, and I will talk more about these challenges uh, facing like vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the different principles that we have learned and how these, these different challenges pose an issue or an opportunity for the principles from APCNF. Could we continue? Um, so a little bit about B2R farms and to Rwanda in general we really dedicated to being a catalyst for change. Like, so we have three initiatives. One is really to help smallholder farmers um, introducing the practices and principle of um, foundations for farming slash conservation agriculture. We had explained a little bit of what foundations for farming means, but it's a method for conservation agriculture to teach it to, to smallholder farmers like in our network to significantly improve the environment, crop yields, personal income and the quality of life. Um, the second thing that we are doing, uh, we have an opportunity to work with more young people and especially those that are leaving university and co college graduates. So um, we want to, we, we provide the training and opportunities for them, like especially graduates from the University of Rwanda, the College of Agriculture, to um, uh, we, 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 we share with them like knowledge in conservation agriculture slash agroecology uh, for them to really be able to use this knowledge to become uh, champions of a conservation agriculture and implement it and launch careers in agriculture. Most young people in our country are afraid of launching careers in agriculture, which is why we are introducing them to these principles that work, um, that are proven for them to adopt it and actually scale it uh, going forward more than um, uh, older people. Um, so that is our other initiatives working with university with university students and university graduates. Uh, our last um, initiative that we do is like really to um, work in the development of profitable horticulture export uh, business. Also, we have um, a business that is working in the um, in the in the export um, farming side for horticulture uh, products. Uh, and here also we see another opportunity for agroecology, things that are grown well and organically, having a little more of um, 
a, a much bigger like income in terms of um, what you can export in different uh, countries and certifications, uh, making the income become higher for, for the farmer than um, growing um, in the traditional way. We can continue. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so as I said, uh, the methods of foundations for farming. So it's a low cost farming method really designed to help um, low income smallholder farmers make a profit. Uh, actually, we have imported this from Zimbabwe. There is a group called Foundations for Farming done in Zimbabwe founded by Brian Aldrich. Um, and um, we have learned about it. That's where we really met with these principles of conservation agriculture, mainly featuring no tillage and like crop um, cover. Um, and we have brought it in Rwanda. And for the past three years, it has given us awesome, um, really awesome um, benefits, um, including like high yields and also reduced soil erosion. Um, next slide, please. So um, in the methods that we have been putting in practice um, is um, minimum um, plowing or minimum tillage. Um, I will not um, explain it more, but um, as I said, in our land in Rwanda, because we are cultivating on slopes, on hills, um, we have found that minimum tillage can actually reduce soil erosion that is happening. Every time that it rains, at least the, the soil erosion has been greatly reduced on the farms of that where we are, we, we, are uh, we are farming. And while it might not make a huge difference in terms of yields uh, in the first year or first season of application, uh, at least the soil erosion is almost reduced immediately. And then in uh, two to three seasons, we have seen that the land can produce more, um, more crops uh, or more yield um, in terms of um, if we, we, we look at yield. Uh, next slide. Um, the other thing that we do is like using permanent planting uh, fertility stations, um, teaching farmers how to um, design the farm in a way that you can continue planting in the same place, like using crops and measurements to allow um, to allow not to till, continue tilling the soil. And this also, it has continued to improve our, our fertility of the soil over, over time. And also these planting stations, um, they help reduce like the inputs that uh, the inputs that we use. So planting on straight lines um, and using the same space to plant all the time, um, minding like crop rotations as well. Um, we have seen that it greatly reduce how much fertilizer, how much chemical, everything that uh, is being used as an input for the smallholder farm. Uh, continue, please. Uh, the other thing is, uh, yeah, so we cover with the mulch. Next slide, please. Um, it's, uh, yeah, practice crop rotations and then keeping costs low so that anybody with any budget can be able to use it. Um, continue so that uh, keep uh, the time well. Um, Okay, so um, in the method also, we have been using um, biostimulants and different top dressings. Um, some of that we have been using include um, the use of comfrey tea where we take comfrey leaves and put them in water, have them fermented for a while and then use that water to um, top dress on our vegetables like really an increase in potassium, and um, that has greatly reduced how much uh, uh, chemical fertilizer, we don't put actually chemical fertilizers in our vegetables using like this comfrey tea. This comfrey tea, uh, it, it greatly improves um, our crops without having to, to top dress with chemical fertilizers. The other thing that we do is the chicken manure soup. Um, it's not in the picture. You can see the comfrey tea, it's like uh, here uh, underneath, um, in like it's a bunch of leaves submerged in water. 
for the chicken manure soup where we take like chicken manure with the grasses and uh, we submerge it in water for three weeks and then use that water um, and mix it with the, um, you know, um, water that is, um, that we, we use to, to water uh, water plants and the vegetables. And uh, using the chicken manure soup in the compost and the country tea actually removes um, the need to be able, to, the need to use like a different other um, fertilizers, other, um, synthetic fertilizers that I use. And the vegetables are much, much better. Like uh, the, the challenge that we were facing is people will not, um, we will not, um, will not see how to use fertilizer for, um, for the vegetables that they are consuming. You find the farmers also having like that issue we saying we are eating more fertilizer. And so this is a good way for them to do it without a feeling that they are ingesting. Um, chemicals in their bodies, um, and they greatly appreciate it. So we can continue um, to the next slide, please. So um, on the principles um, that we have learned in the in the sharing group, um, what we have been uh, we have we have started or we have we were already practicing, as I said. Um, Low uh, or no, uh, no or low tillage. Um, that's something that we are doing, and it's giving us results. Really responding to Rwanda's issue of soil erosion. The other thing that we have been able to do is the use of biostimulants, uh, especially the seed coating. And here, um, this um, this has really solved some of the issues that we have because they are uh, being able to get inoculants for different crops um, is really difficult and will require a farmer to order it from uh, two a couple institutions um, and it will be very difficult to get like those inoculants in time so APCNF really does present us the ability to be able to produce these inoculants that a farmer can do themselves in, in around their farms without going very far. So it's a great opportunity. So we have started using this after the, the training I, and I will show you some pictures at the end. Uh, the other thing, uh, the organic matter addition, uh, in this case, we use using mulch. Um, I have to say that this is one of, um, it, and the mulch that we are using is the crop residue from a previous crop from, let's say if you where we are planting maize and then growing beans afterwards. So farmers are using like the maize stover to be able to mulch um, the beans and then vice versa. This other, uh, this is also one of the biggest challenges, however, because, um, because mulch is is hard to get. So some people uh, feed some of the crop residue to cows uh, or the, like to animals and everything. So there is competition for the mulch. Others are using um, uh, things from like the swamps, some grasses from the swamps to be able to use. But because the demand for mulch is really high, it's becoming very expensive for a farmer to be able to at least get something to cover. And in here, we have like the solution that is there is uh, for agroforestry to at least grow crops um, among, um, among, among uh, grow trees among the crops and the, the, the trees can be pruned to use. And I think ECRAF will have much more information about this, but um, the organic matter addition, especially in terms of mulch is one of the biggest challenges we have. Uh, the other thing that we have done in the pest management, although um, it's not complete, we have used like some uh, homemade um, rem uh, homemade things to use for uh, fighting pests. Some that we have already used is like using spoiled milk, uh, like fermented milk, um, and uh, also black jacks. Uh, the black jack, we also put them in water, uh, ferment them for a while, and then use that water to, um, to fight. Uh, it has become effective on aphids and some, um, some other small pests, but um, we are still uh, looking for more in terms of how, we, how can we use pest management techniques that do not involve the spraying of chemicals. Like I said, now uh, for fighting worm is very difficult with some of that we have used and something that we'll love to know more as we continue this partnership with AFSA and the colleagues in India. 
Lastly, for no chemical stress, I already shared some of the things that we have done. Um, thank you so much um, for the compost and more, but we had still um, farmers are also reluctant on how, you know, if, if this can really uh, replace the NPK or the DAP fertilizers that they are using. Uh, continue. Uh, 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 this is the biostimulant, the bijam rutham, um, which is cow dung and cow urine and, uh, and also lime and water that um, we have learned from the colleagues in India. So it, it, it produces, continue on the next slide, slides, please. So this co um, makes like uh, a seed coating that we can use before planting. And we are, we, we are, um, we are, we are still comparing the results, and maybe in coming um, in the coming few months we'll be sharing in terms of yields what is happening. But it has worked for us, and it is really replacing the the need that we had for inoculants that farmers did not have right in front of them. Continue. Um, you can. Put yeah, so you can see the seed being planted in the middle after being coated with the, the bijam rutam. And then um, here, um, this um, um, uh, she is pro uh, like Leoni is like making holes, planting stations to be able to drop in like different seeds for either maize and more. But you can see she's making like uh, a hole without tilling the whole soil. And then after doing that, we are using like crop residue to be able to mulch that field, as you can see on the last picture. Continue. So, um, conclude. Um, so these are the principles that we are currently struggling with. Uh, the crop cover for 365 days going with the crop diversity from three to 24 varieties of crops in one area. Uh, one is um, the, we have uh, an, a push uh, from the government program to um, you know, consolidate land and um, consolidate land and the farmer cooperatives growing one crop on multiple um, multiple areas, making it very difficult to mix maybe three to 24 varieties of crops in one area. The other thing is also some farmers are growing things for uh, to, just for the market. And so mixing many crops in one area, uh, the question that keeps coming is how many how many kilograms of beans will I get if it's mixed with cucumbers and more? So it will be small quantities um, for a farmer. Um, and then they can, um, and, and then to be able to take things to the market, it becomes a challenge. But um, so we would love to, uh, the community, one of the things that we are looking into is like the community aspect of CNF, which um, we want to learn about where many people have, um, Many, where many people can, can be able to aggregate yields. But this is the challenge because people want more production of a certain crop to be able to take to the market. Uh, no till, yeah, we, we have done it. When, once uh, farmers can see where it is working or, and we have it on many demonstration sites, they can easily adopt it. But the challenge here also, much like the people in Zimbabwe is uh, weeds like couch grass and the more that keep infesting lands. And so farmers still to be able to remove those grasses in order to, um, to plant. As I said, also mulch is a problem. So it makes it if they don't need to remove those grasses, they can easily take over the crop and compete with it. So that's a, an area where we need like <laughs> support. And if anybody has done it here, I'm happy to get the feedback. The other thing is also integrate animals. Yes, so many Rwandans have cows, but it's not everyone and like access to like some of the, um, the, the, the material, a lot of the material on a consistent basis, much for what we have learned in Andhra Pradesh, it requires a lot of manure and people will have to buy it. And so that becomes a different challenge um, in some areas um, in, 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 uh, in our country, not every area, but like, um, Animal integration is something we have not done yet. Uh, the, organ, um, the use of local seeds. Here, the challenge is that um, we have also another government program that is encouraging people to use hybrid seeds because they can produce much more yield and um, 
crops that are resistant to particular pests and disease. So with that being said, I really appreciated the, the, the seed bank that the people, the people from Suro are using, but we don't have um, a, a system where local seeds can continue to be used because we have an encouragement to be able to use hybrid seeds that are also subsidized under the government program. So that is also an area of challenge. And the other thing that you get from the farmer is that some of these local seeds will not be able to produce compete for yields. Farmers love it. Um, they love the local seeds, but the issue is now production. How, 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 how does it produce more? Uh, pest management has already said it because once you apply some of these natural rem remedies, um, it might be too late or it might not be as effective and people will uh, you know, resort to using like some chemical pesticides. Um, no stress, this is another thing that some farmers are still working with like subsidized fertilizers. But the opportunity here is that um, the, the, the chemical fertilizers, the, the costs are rising, um, really help, uh, making some people re look for other solutions um, that, that are available. I would say the average smallholder farmer, actually, they will prefer not to put fertilizer in their fields. Um, however, then the question becomes how much yield can they expect? So these are the principles that we are currently struggling with. Um, I have already said this about uh, the issue with crop diversity and everything. So that's what we have been doing and we are looking Thank for you. more opportunities to keep practicing. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, great, uh, Rosine, uh, for uh, your great uh, presentation and uh, for highlighting some of those uh, principles. And uh, I think from the chats, we've been seeing um, some of the participants are asking what is uh, APCNF. This is the Andhra Pradesh Community Natural Farming. And uh, maybe for those who are uh, new uh, here, we are focusing on uh, sharing the nine principles of uh, natural farming. And uh, this is coming from uh, a background of uh, shared collaboration and uh, shared presentations uh, with the Andhra Pradesh um, community natural farming uh, brought, brought courtesy of uh, collaboration between uh, AFSA and uh, learning sharing group. Um, there are some uh, questions and clarifications from um, participants and uh, Theodo, Theodo, you had some question. If you can uh, just share, if you can listen to me. Theodore, are you there? Oui, allô. Oui, allô. Yes, yes, yes. Please uh, go okay, ahead. Merci. Bon, en fait, ma question est adressée à l'ensemble des participants. L'idée pour moi, c'était de... Je me posais la question parce que je suis en train de vouloir mener une étude qui vise à voir un peu la transition écologique dans nos pays du Sud. Et l'objectif pour moi, c'est déjà de comprendre est-ce qu'au sens large du terme, c'est-à-dire qu'au sens, au sens profond du terme, Est-ce qu'il est possible de trouver des exploitations, des exploitations agroécologiques? Si tel n'est pas le cas, est-ce qu'il faut s'intéresser plutôt aux exploitations qui ont une bonne pratique écologique? Voilà donc. Oui, il y a quelqu'un qui parle. Voilà, donc pour reprendre rapidement, en fait, comme je l'ai dit, le, le but, c'est de voir un peu la transition écologique dans nos pays du Sud. Maintenant, l'objectif pour moi, c'est d'abord de définir concrètement est-ce qu'il est possible d'abord de trouver des exploitations qui, ont, qui sont à 100% agroécologiques dans le pays, c'est-à-dire qu'ils n'utilisent aucun, aucun, aucun élément chimique, en fait. Alors, si tel n'est pas le cas, est-ce qu'il ne faut pas peut-être partir sur la base d'un certain nombre de pratiques, de bonnes pratiques et écologiques et définir peut-être un score et s'intéresser à ceux-là qui ont un bon score. Voilà, pour un peu faire une étude un peu, si j'allais dire, extrapolable avec une base de données tirée un échantillon pour ne pas faire un truc, j'allais dire, empirique. Merci. Great. 
I think uh, these uh, learning and sharing sessions are um, as a result of um, very, very good uh, implementation by the Andhra Pradesh uh, state, which um, is being adopted and has been adopted by over 1 million uh, uh, people. And uh, I think through uh, AFSA, this was thought to be a good learning uh, collaboration for many organizations in Africa who are struggling with um, food sovereignty uh, issues. And uh, with that background, this learning and sharing uh, session was, sessions were initiated so that we can have um, common uh, learning spaces for improvement and uh, for action. Uh, thank you so much, Theodor, for your uh, seeking clarification. And thank you, um, Rosine, for your great uh, presentation. Um, I can see from uh, the chats, um, Peter, you, you have some, um, some, some comments, Peter Gables. Yeah, thank you, Rosine, for, uh, I just have two quick questions. I don't want to take a lot of time. You mentioned that the soils in Rwanda are acidic. And I, you know, I'm, I know that often repeated use of nitrogen fertilizer causes soil to become more acidic. So is it naturally acidic or is it, um, you know, due to a lot of fertilizer use? I was wondering if you could clarify that. And then a second question that's related is that you talked about your third initiative about export crops and that's fine, but often export crops are tend to be grown uh, with hybrid seed, with fertilizer and monoculture. And I'm just wondering if you have developed an alternative model for export crops or is that, you know, is it still characterized by those, you know, that, that tendency to be monoculture and use of, um, of, you know, hybrid seed and all that type of thing that usually is associated with export crops. So, those are my two questions, um, and I and I realize that you know transitions are are a challenge, and that's what we're trying to learn. So this is not implied to be a critique at all. I'm just wondering where you are in your system. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Peter. Um, starting with the first question, yes, um, the acidic soils, um, some of the acidic soils in Rwanda, there are spaces where people have been using lots and lots of. Um, lots of lots of chemical fertilizers, and that is an issue. Um, some might be um, also due to like uh, yeah. So the, the acidity, some some of it comes from where people are using like lots of fertilizers, like in our northern areas where people are growing um, um, different crops like Irish potatoes. There is an overuse of fertilizers uh, that is really problematic, and where some places can't not, cannot produce anymore. It's not widespread, but it's something that if you are not careful, something, something bad could happen. So um, what we are doing is to um, share with some of them like demonstrations of how they can use less chemicals. Like one, some of the things that we have done uh, is to um, share how they can grow Irish potatoes using like the corn free tea um, and the compost and the, like using a mulch without eating the soil and using really half of like half of the inputs that everybody is using and produce actually more yield. Um, so that 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 is that has happened. But also um, as Professor Elias is saying in the in the chat, um, some soils also are naturally naturally acidic, um, naturally acidic erosion also contributing to erosion also contributing to um to to part of the like the soil degradation that is happening so uh, yeah those are the issues of, like that are contributing to the acidity of the soil and some of it the government is um using like um a lime program to like to to help reduce the acidity coupled with the use of um yeah so that the use of lime and also like compost and more of those types of fertilizer uh, like things are uh, to help the soil um the other thing also yes we are helping farmers be able to use lime which was not used 
before. Uh, your last question, yes, that, uh, on export, it is a challenge and we are trying to figure out the models to be able to produce export crops without using the type of commercial farming that has already, like that has already wrecked um, different issues. I would say that the challenge now, um, the challenge that we have right now is to be able to um, have indigenous seed that can compete on an export level. So that's a challenge where we don't have, we don't have a solution yet for like not use hybrid seed, chili peppers and more. Um, the other thing that we are struggling with is um, chemicals, how to produce homemade um, uh, pest management um, uh, solutions that do not, um, that do not involve the overuse of chemicals and pesticides in the, in the operations. So this is our newest initiative that we are continuing building information about. I am happy to share more solutions um, in further calls that we will have. But this is still like a transition where we are trying to, like to work the model out to be able to include the natural farming in the export place, but we don't have indigenous seed, yes. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Rosine, for your feedback and uh, questions around uh, soil acidity uh, from the chat. Um, uh, it's also to do with uh, the volcanic soils, which are um, said to be naturally acidic, and also um, low organic matter uh, encourages uh, acidity. Thank you, thank you for that learning, and I think for uh, participants, uh, can have access to some of the links that have been shared uh, on the chats. And you can also have a direct uh, email uh, to the presenters so that you can uh, seek more information, uh, for instance, about uh, pelleting and about the biostimulants and how uh, you can improve your own practices. Thank you so much, Rosine, for your great uh, presentation. And uh, we are glad to have had you. Uh, last but not least, we now will uh, go to Atanas from uh, ICRAF so that we can uh, listen to the last uh, presentation. Um, Atanas? Yes. You have the floor. Thank you very much. Let me start first by the question asked to uh, to my colleague Rosine, I, I think the acidity we have is located in the western uh, province of the country and is mainly related to rock, mud rock. And it, is, it has also the component which is very dangerous we call aluminum toxicity. But for the mineral, the influence is very little because we don't use much mineral fertilizer uh, if you see the quantity per hectare is, is, is very little and it is splitted in different crops. So the influence is very little, but it is there. So it's very little. So my presentation is why natural farming now and the role of agroforestry in natural farming. Why natural farming now? I think now you realize that land are degraded and the most part of degradation of land there is the driver of degradation. You have deforestation, soil erosion. I think my colleagues say that inappropriate cropping system, continuous declining soil nutrients, and the former poverty as a consequence of above. There is also loss of biodiversity, of course, due to this land degradation. There is loss of biodiversity. That is why we are doing a lot of effort to convince CBD that there is a niche for biodiversity agriculture landscape. We have also the effect of using massive pests and diseases. This pesticide, which destroy many uh, biodiversity like bees, uh, even if farmers start complaining. There is the effort of climate change, heavy rainfall, which disturbs agriculture season, you have a prolonged drought, you have opportunist pests and diseases, and you have many uh, like that. So natural farming uh, solution is cost-effective, address a trip challenge, 
naturally recover the, nat the nature, biodiversity, climate change adaptation, food security, and so on. Provide for people needs, ecosystem service, firewood, soil fertility, erosion control, mitigate the climate risk. That is what I come to say. So that is why natural farming solution is very urgent in the strategy of land restoration. And if you see my picture on your right, come back again, you see how erosion is very huge. And you see this photo, and you see uh, the drought problem. And down there, you see agroforestry solution and the other solution. That is what Rosine said. If I add it to the context of Rosine, even to Rwanda, we have two situations in Rwanda. You have the high altitude, where you have a regular rainfall, you can even crop it during the rainy, dry season. But we have a low altitude semi-arid area where we, have, we face drought. For example, during this season, I represented the results. You found that everywhere in Bugesera, I, I, I think Rosine didn't harvest, except you have an irrigation system. There was a drought, farmer didn't harvest. But under tree, they managed to harvest even the yield was reduced. So you can see the, the crop are still on, on, in the field. They are almost near to harvest, but the under tree, really that is where you found the crop. Next, please. Next. So this is, is a kind of experiment. This is high altitude. You see potato under uh, Arino Sakiminata, and you see are pruning. And these biomass are used to improve um, soil fertility and uh, to, 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 to increase organic matter. And here in the semi arid, that is a long term experiment, is a pilot demonstration. When a farmer comes to learn this principle of natural farming, and you see the maize, that is the maize during the dry season, where you have a Ferdebia, you have a Maricamia, you have a Greveria and the gravery are pruned to get the access to light. Next. So we have a three principle we try to address is the tillage system, is tree cover, tree diversity, and also improving organic matter through incorporation of green manure. Next, please. So here you have uh, I have, uh, I don't see other side. If I, here you have uh, uh, different uh, 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 agroforestry species. In why, in why you have a uh, uh, yield of crop, and down there you have uh, uh, different agroforestry species. We call a fertilizer species, and these species are regular uh, pruned. And in this system we use different tillage. We use conventional tillage, minimum tillage, zero tillage. And I think in this experiment, when we talk about natural farming, we must have evidence to convince the farmer to say that you see it is working and you have a, a real result. So if you consider this graph, you found that the conventional tillage, which is regular tillage like a control, that is, which is produced high because this experiment is only two season. But minimum tillage is there for two season, which show that this minimum tillage can, after a long time, can be able to go beyond this conventional tillage when you have erosion, when you have um, less infiltration, and when the crop are exposed during the dry season. So the zero tillage is really down because you know we have a two serene season, even if there is a sometimes the drought, but it is a zero tillage because we have a two season wheat come oftenly and it gives hard work to farmer to always remove this wheat. So that is slash, that is why it gives low yield due to the competition of, with, with wheat. So another think this Kaliandra Green City Arisena are a source of organic input because we use this green manure to increase organic matter, but to increase the nitrogen also and the other nutrient. But also during the cropping season, 
uh, during the drought season, they are there and they cover the soil. They approve the soil moisture. The soil are not exposed to drought. So which means that you still have residual moisture in the soil. And you see the result, the conventional tillage is greater than minimum tillage and greater than zero tillage. Next, please. Next. So here you have, you have a different fertilizer we use on my side. Let me remove this. Oh, sorry. Sorry, can you uh, please share the presentation? Reshare the presentation, please. Wilson. Hello, Wilson. Hello. Hello, this Hello is Charles. Charles. You lose yeah. the presentation. Can you share again? Do I go back to the previous slide? Okay. This slide becomes small. I don't know why. I don't see it. Uh, okay. okay. I saw now. Now I saw it. So okay. here you have uh, uh, in in the X you have a conventional tillage. You have a minimum zero tillage, and you have a maize yield. And the other side you have a different uh, fertilizer tip, and the, where you wrote a residue, and the standard that is a tree biomass. And the, I try now to show if you use mineral fertilizer combined with residue, of course, you have a higher yield in a different, uh, in a different tillage system. But you see that uh, uh, when you use uh, tree biomass, the results are between zero and, the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the zero tillage and the conventional tillage, which is good also for two seasons. By increasing organic matter, you can come up to, you can get the superior result to residue plus, the, uh, plus mineral fertilizer. That means that organic matter is not enough in two seasons to take time, but also we can get additional source of phosphorus because that is the key in agroforestry. That is why is we use the mineral fertilizer, but using chicken manure or using uh, other species like a titonia, you can be able to increase phosphorus in the soil and remove out uh, this mineral fertilizer. Please, go. Na next slide, please. So here you have now variation of moisture through different agroforestry species. You have the distance and you have the different uh, species like G, uh, is meaning Graveria robusta, you have a Maricamia rutea, you have a Feridebia. And the interesting, you see how much is the, is the uh, variation of moisture. With Graveria, you see clear that the moisture is reducing where you move far from the farmer. It's like we are simulating crop alone. So when we move away of a tree, the moisture reduces. Under tree, you have a higher moisture and the, uh, around the zero, uh, 0.75 centimeter distance. And the, if you consider also for Debbie Albida, you see the same, almost the same trend, but if the diminution is not uh, really clear. When you see uh, Maricamia rutea, we did understand the result, but that is what the data give us. You see that much air is increasing where you are far away of uh, the canopy of tree. Next, please, Wilson. Next, please. Next, please, okay. Thank you. That is, a, that is a conclusion. So minimum tillage is a promising practice in agroforestry system with the following advantage. There is an increase of organic matter there is also stop soil erosion because uh, as the Rosin says, it's a slope area. So you can stop erosion, minimize erosion like a progressive terraces you do. You increase microorganism activity and the biodiversity. You increase water infiltration. And in terms of moisture, you have a tree maintain a higher content moisture under canopy than in a conventional tillage without the trees. And we have a permanent tree cover as the tree are remaining on the field. And during the dry season, they protect the soil. 
And also we have additional product, which is very important. We fit the driver for adoption, firewood, food, steak for climb beans, and the surface like erosion and soil fertility, biodiversity below and, the, and the above ground. You have the income for farmer. For example, if you grow fruit, farmer get more income. This firewood they can sell. Steak for climb beans, they can also sell if they have access. You have also carbon sequestration. Next, please. Yes, that was your conclusion. <laughs> next, please. So what we need to do, uh, what I think the, the next for natural farming is to understand and address a critical driver for adoption of farming practice, is also to establish community of practice for natural farming in a participatory demonstration plot and stimulate the movement of farmer. That is what we did by establishing this long-term trial where you have a different native species and exotic species. So farmer can come and learn there and they can observe themselves because the farmer uh, practice by, by, by observing and learning. To build the capacity of farmer and the extension other agents for effective adoption of natural farming, Introduce livestock. That is what we wanted to do to buy some goat, which is easy to grow for a farmer so that we can increase the capacity of a farmer for manure production and water harvest. The issue is that you can have a natural farming, but when you don't have water, that is the issue. You have a crop failure, and when there is crop failure, there is no adoption. That is what a farmer likes. They like to have a food security, to have a food so that you must, like or not, in a semi-arid area, come put it together with irrigation, water harvesting, and when you don't have a possibility, link with this energy, dealing with irrigation, and use also biostimulant. Uh, and particularly the most important issue is the pest diseases. That we have a problem with that. I think in Rwanda, we are not yet there there to control the pest diseases, the farmers are crying and we are losing. Thank you very much. I think I exhausted my presentation and I thank you and I'm ready to address some questions and comments you have. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor. I think that was a great uh, presentation from you and uh, you've uh, really stressed uh, the strategies to increase organic matter using the trees and um, supported that with uh, your research uh, information. Thank you so much for your presentation. And um, we are just about to conclude and maybe just some few uh, remarks. And uh, sorry, we do not have uh, John Wilson with us. He was feeling unwell and we had to step in. Uh, to moderate and just keep uh, the presentations going. Um, before we conclude, I'll just ask uh, Stephanie to be ready maybe with some concluding uh, remarks. We have about five minutes and uh, welcome, welcome Stephanie. Do you have any, any remarks from uh, um, Professor's uh, presentation from ICRAF? Good morning again, everyone. Uh, so you're giving me the floor again, Ferdinand, it's becoming a habit, hey? Always me on the spot. <laughs> uh, so thanks very much for, for the three presentation and, and including uh, Professor Mukura in that presentation at the end. Um, I think this is something actually we haven't really uh, listened to much in the previous sessions, you know, the, the integration of trees in, in our um, farming system. So I think it's really, important that we, we finish this session on, on the, the role of agroforestry in, in natural farming. Um, you would remember last year we had we had some some uh, learning sessions from this international scientists on that, but it seems like the, the partners who presented in the past few sessions, um, they, they haven't really touched on that. So something maybe to further investigate and see how best we can um, integrate more trees in our farming landscapes. Um, I think I'll stop there. I'm, I'm not sure about the next uh, the next steps, Ferdinand. Actually, because this today was um, the the last session of the series, wasn't it? So may, I don't know if you've got any anything to share on that about what's yes. what 
topic next. Yes, time. yes, yes. That was the last, uh, this was the last uh, session and uh, we're expecting to have a synthesis uh, of all that uh, we've uh, presented and uh, that will be shared uh, uh, with uh, our colleagues from uh, Andhra Pradesh and then uh, there will be um, that synthesis process I think will also be shared when we have uh, a call to synthesize and put together uh, some of the issues uh, that have uh, come out of this um, uh, presentation and the learnings and the, the way forward. Um, thank you, thank you for that, uh, Stephanie. And uh, any last comments, uh, Charles? Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Ferdinand, for moderating this session. And I want to thank all the participants who have taken off their time to be here. And in a special way, I want to thank uh, the presenters, uh, Karai Gumisai from Tsuro, uh, Athanas and Androzi. Yeah, thank you so much for enlightening us, for educating us about uh, the work you are doing uh, in line with the Andhra Pradesh Community Natural Farming uh, Principles. I've really learned a lot from you and uh, I'll continue learning. And also when I get an opportunity, I can always uh, share uh, with the others. Thank you so much, Ferdinand. Yeah, that's all from my end. Uh, thank you, everybody. And uh, please, I hope you get the connections, you get the links and uh, keep um, um, connecting to these uh, Zoom uh, meetings. You will uh, be informed in the due course of uh, the next uh, steps. And uh, Michael, I think uh, everything is okay. And uh, thank you, all the presenters. Thank you. I think we had uh, a great opportunity to share. And um, I'll just um, request everybody who is, um, when it is possible, if you can just um, um, open your video and just wave uh, to say bye to everybody as you leave. Bye bye. Bye bye. 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 Okay. okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Nice to catch up with you again. Take care. Bye. 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 Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Prof. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Presentation. Michael. Bye. Peter. Bye, man. Good to see you again. Bye. Okay, see you next time. <laughs>